friends of WHA-TV. The Dane County Cultural Affairs Commission and the Wisconsin Arts Board. Jazz is in trouble, absolutely. But the spirit of jazz is not in trouble. Now, there's three points in learning. is uh, reading about it, theorizing, and doing it. You know, and a jazz player, he has to do it as he's learning it. You compose as you are playing. and I'll answer you. Wrong key. At a high school in the heart of the Midwest, two renowned jazz musicians spread the word that jazz is alive. Baba baba bee bop. Yeah, that's it. See? Do bop again. You got it, you know? <laughs> now, wait a minute here. Now, wait a minute. See you know you what? Started? I hear you doing it. I'm not putting you on. I hear you doing it, and then I hear you catch yourself doing it, and, and like internally going, my God, have I just done it? And stop. <laughs> Steal it. Steal I'm from the best. From their home base in Madison, Wisconsin, internationally known bassist Richard Davis and performer reporter Ben Citrin are ambassadors at large for an American art form. They point out that jazz may be in trouble, but that reports of its death are indeed greatly exaggerated. Wisconsin's Monona Grove is part of their high school teaching circuit. Here the music meets the kids in this unique jazz class, and if Davis and Sidron have their way, these young people will keep jazz alive well into the next century. I think we both have a tendency to want to read the faces, to want to see so let's do that. Uh, what it is that, you know, we might say, well, what is it that you want, want to leave here with? What do you expect from us? What is it that you're after? Some don't know, and some are ready to say, well, look, I, uh, I need to know the answer to this. I wonder how many people here have tried to play jazz or do play jazz. Great, <laughs> great. What are the problems you have? I end up playing blues all the time and I try to get away from that and I can't figure out how to do that. Stay with the blues maybe, just yeah. shift it up. Jazz is the blues, you can't get too far yeah, you don't want. Yeah, you don't want to get too far from that. Yeah, it won't sound, you know, your teacher taught you well. If you state the blues, make the blues statement. Davis and Sidron know how to captivate the class, but it's not all dazzle. These are, after all, top professionals who know there's more to music than meets the ear. questions so far about what we were doing then? I have a question about what we were doing. I have several questions about what we were doing. Um, we obviously played the melody of the song Up Jump Spring and then went into the solos and I kind of looked out of the corner of my eye and I saw Richard had his eyes closed and he was playing so I thought okay I better play the first solo because I can't get his attention now. Tell him to do it. So I took the first solo but then 
after his solo, uh, it wasn't clear whether we were going to solo again or play the melody again. We both kind of were soloing together. And I noticed him playing some very broad triplet. Well, it's in three. One, two, three, two, two, three. But against that feel, he was playing bow, 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 bow. It's a triplet on top of a three feeling. I heard him do that. So I started kind of trying to do that with him, falling down through the changes that way. And then I started thinking, well, if you're going to do bow, 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 that's almost like one, two, one, two. It's almost like a two against a three. So at the end of that song, I wasn't sure what we were doing, if we were going to play a very broad uh, Too. See, right against that. Doom, gang, gang, to go, gang, gang. We never done that. We should do that. No, we should do that. We I should like that. <laughs> the whole idea is exposure. Now, in most schools, jazz commentator, <laughs> historian, <laughs> and writer schools Nat Hentoff. Jazz is considered. Uh, it's not considered at all. It's not even considered enough to be put down. It's. Uh, it's just not. A, it's not culture. If you could get to them in high school, junior high school, and grade school then the seed is, is more implanted. When they come into the university, man, they're, they're ready. Really? Ready. Uh, my pleasure being here. Thanks. So if there's any time, any reason for you to be, uh, have some questions answered, just call the university. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Talk okay, to you and see what we can do. Bye. Thanks a lot. See ya. <laughs> but high school is only one platform that Ben Sidron and Richard Davis use to spread the word. As professor, Davis brings a worldwide reputation and special teaching skills to his full-time job in the University of Wisconsin School of Music. <laughs> it's up to me, really. Yeah. I mean, they do what I tell them. You know, <laughs> this is it, you know what I mean? He combines the ear of a seasoned musician with the careful eye of a concerned teacher as he auditions students for the Black Music Ensemble. Yeah. I'm going to put you in a, a, a group that uh, has some experience to you. I could play um, Blue Bossa. Uh huh. Is that blues? Yeah, sort of. Well, in the same vein. Mm hmm. <laughs> what about straight blues? Okay. Uh, yeah, I could do that. I could play blues enough. Yeah, would you know what I was asking you if I say play some rhythm changes? Yeah. You do? Ah, good. How do you spell Eggerstrand? E-G-E-R-S-T-R-A-N-D. Okay, you made it. Congratulations. <laughs> this is the one. Just check it out. Body and soul. Students will find it's total immersion in jazz when they sign up here. Jazz as discipline, history, performance, creation, and sound. Kids coming up, more so than at any time in the history of the music, are very much involved, not only in what they hear, but in, in, what they, they, in how they study, uh, with the whole history of the, of the music. 
I think we're at a period of jazz now of, of, of um, it's not so much consolidation, but it's, a, it's a, a deeper understanding all the way around of everything that's gone before. Okay, who wants to go first? What I try to do is okay. not tell them anything at first when I give them an assignment to see what they come up with. Okay, now she had it all in her mind. She came in with a very, uh, you know, a lot of confidence, solidified a group in no time. And you get uh, your yeah. students to react to a stimuli of what you give and to <laughs> what you want them to really get. <laughs> and I think I got this from my high school teacher. Because he, he uh, made you want to know, and he took a chance. I took a chance. The chance paid off. After paying his dues in Chicago, Davis got the phone call every musician hopes for. The call that leads to the big break. In Davis' case, from singer Sarah Vaughan. As soon as I got the call from the office, first, you know, when he said, this is Sarah Vaughan's office call, and I said, wow, you know, <laughs> maybe you want me to sweep the floor for him or something, you know. <laughs> And I knew she had Roy Haynes and Jimmy Jones with her, you know, in a trio. And I said, how could I ever, you know, picture myself fitting in with, with them? And then uh, I guess the first couple of nights I was kind of nervous. And third night I just said, wait a minute, you know, let me just go out there and play me. You know, they must have called me here for a reason. <laughs> they must like me, you know. He's a good bass player, so he is. So all of a sudden I just let it all hang out and uh, I could feel the feedback from all of them. They looked around and said, yeah, yeah okay, now you're now you opening up. You know, it was, I was very excited to get a call from such, a, such an artist as Sarah. Well, when I get good ones, I hope I don't lose them. When I get good musicians, I would like to keep them forever. Because it's very difficult finding, for me, the kind of musicians that I like. During his time with Sarah Vaughan and in the following years, Richard Davis became and remains one of the premier bass players in the world. He's performed with every major jazz musician of the last 30 years, from Ahmad Jamal to Zoot Sims. He's worked with Bruce Springsteen, Igor Stravinsky, and the Manhattan Transfer. And when he can, Davis returns to New York to play with old friends. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for my friends indeed.
York? No, I wouldn't like to live there anymore, no. I'm glad to be there for the stimuli and the hearing the great music and playing with the great musicians who are so numerous there, you know, the stimuli is good. And what makes Richard Davis distinctive, uh, to understate the case, is not only that he can do it, he can, he can execute everything he hears, and he hears a lot going on simultaneously, but he's remarkably able to fit into all kinds of, of jazz modes, idioms, whatever you want to call them, without A, distorting them, or, on the other hand, losing his own very singular identity. Uh, he plays with all kinds of modernists and postmodernists and post-postmodernists. He's worked with Stravinsky. I mean, there isn't any, any context. He's a true musician in the, in the, in the ecumenical sense. He, he, he understands all these things. He becomes part of them, but it's always, you always know that it's Richard Davis. Davis traded Times Square and the subways for a piece of land in the country and thoroughbred horses. I think the thing that brought me here is that I just wanted to have a chance to reflect on things, not work around the clock all the time. I was working like, uh, you know, all around the clock, you know, never a chance to really lay back and look at what I was doing and not a chance to have any family life in a, what you might call the best sense, you know, having time. So um, I feel good about that. Being away from that kind of rat race. Yeah, I kind of ran my hand down there. I could feel just a little different. I'm trying to get develop a feel for that. Mm -hmm. I just called the farmer next door. I know he's busy, man. He's doing tons of work. And I said, John, you got about five minutes? Yeah, what do you need? Came right on down. Then when he gets here, he kind of relaxes and spends a half an hour with you talking about, you know, would you try that in New York? <laughs> you got five minutes. What? Are you crazy? The move to Wisconsin opened new musical directions for Davis. The album Harvest, with pianist Consuela Lee Moorhead, was composed and performed as Davis wrote, in honor of all the life around me. before he realizes the blues, you might say, you know? And if a musician can't play the blues, jazz musician, then he can't play jazz. And sometimes the blues comes from doing without or not having. And how do you become inventive when you don't have something to be able to feel the thing that maybe you haven't felt before? Right 
see, jazz is uh, on the spot learning. You, you, you theorize and you say you try it at that next moment on the instrument. music, jazz is a way of living. <laughs> you still are telling me that you're a good singer and that you're holding notes out and making beautiful long tones. That's what musicianship is all about, producing long, beautiful sounds. <laughs> you can't do that. People will say, hey, she's a great singer, but no feeling. There's no story there. I want you to take that knowledge and use and make a story. See, everything is, you say, I say, you should have said fish. People say fish, say fish. People see a whole school of fish and they're jumping. The fish are jumping, you know what I mean? Fish jumping means, hey, we're gonna eat tonight. Those guys, get, those, get that net, you know what I mean? We're gonna eat tonight. You just sing. Fish are dropping as if we eat every day. We haven't eaten have eat in a week. And the season now, those guys are jumping out of there. Amen, Brother Richard. <laughs> You're eating too good, Amy. Miss a few meals. Taste, taste. That's what the music is, taste. Color. Color, the same thing. Tell me a story, baby. Call the voice. You were then I was talking to Abby Fermansky about that, trying to get her to feel the song. Everything was straight at first. Now she began to feel, how can I color that? Sidron recalls his first meeting with Davis. Yeah, I was in a recording studio. I was at this date where he was on a record I made in 1978, and I just hired him because I was in New York, and it was Richard, and I wanted to record with him. Mm, dude, dude. We got along. I mean, he's so likable. We got along real well. And we got to talking. I told him I lived in Madison. He said, well, I'm on my way to the University of Wisconsin. And uh, I couldn't believe it. PhD historian and author Ben Sidron shares with Richard Davis his hometown and a devotion to jazz. As a performer, composer, and reporter, making converts to jazz is a constant with Sidron. As a scholar, he's challenged. With an art form that defies traditional study, how do you hand down what you've learned about it? I don't want to formalize what I know. I don't want to know it in terms of uh, Roman numeral one, capital A, you know, middle C. On the other hand, I really would like to be able to pass along what I've learned. Uh, how do you make a melody sing on the piano? How do you make the piano sing? When, when we do the theme, here's the way the All Things Considered theme is literally written. If I can even play it the way it's really written. 
everybody's going to say, oh, I know that song. Oh, yeah, that's okay. I'll let that in for a second. And once they let me in, I want to do something with them. Sidron plays the familiar theme of the National Public Radio program, All Things Considered, to which he's a regular contributor. Well, what a jazz musician will do, we think we're making it more interesting. To some people, we're making it more threatening. Ben's son, Leo, is the second musician in the family. Here, playtime turns into a songwriting lesson. When I deal with Leo, and I'm talking to Leo, play a melody for me. What I'm trying to find is the language to say to somebody for whom language is still fairly new. Uh, make it sing. There's a voice inside the song that wants to come out. And what you want to do is help that voice out. says that when she writes a melody, the first thing she does is she thinks of a story. Like one of her songs is about uh, two fish in the ocean. And one of the fish says to the other fish, you're the only fish for me. And the other fish says, oh no, there are plenty of fish in the sea. And then the first fish says, no, no, you're the only fish that I could ever touch. <laughs> and the second fish says, oh, but there must be another fish that you would love as much. Mm. That's a conversation between two fish. Mm -hmm. And she said she started with this idea of these two fish talking and wrote melodies for each fish to say. Like, what does it sound like when one fish says to another one, you're the only fish in the ocean? I don't know. I don't either. Well, that's the thing. So let's start with that. Okay. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Uh, the boy talks on the one chord and on the three chord. And the girl talks. On the two chord and on the four chord. You got it. And I'll play the chords for you. And you be the boy and the girl. Yeah. One, two, <laughs> one, two, three, four. But as a man who makes his living with words as well as music, Sidron knows that lyrics use a different voice to teach people about jazz. I've always written lyrics. Mm -hmm. I've written lyrics since I was 20 years old to, to songs. Then they were a way for me to do something that I couldn't do any other way. I can't do it lecturing. I can't do it on the radio. I can't do it on television. I mean, now I've got all these other things going on, but there are some things I can only do through lyrics.
They play piano and it went like this. They would swing as sweet as the angels kiss. I've been hearing George Shearing running steady with Freddie Red. Yes, talk about piano players. In the past, they really knew how to fly. They were a one-way trip on a magic carpet ride. In the park with Sonny Clark walking through the dark with Bud Powell. Oh, won't you listen to them? Walter Bishop, Walter Norris. Walter Davis and Walter to wall explorers like a Wynton Kelly and Art Tatum, Phineas, Thelonious, any way you rate them, the music that they made, it's alive today. Cause when you hear Cecil Taylor, you hear Jelly Roll play, and nearing that clearing, you're hearing the real McCoy. Oh, let's roll them, Roy. Silver, Horace Parlin, Barry Harris, don't forget Red Garland, a Herbie Nichols, a Harold Mayburn, Flanagan, Ellington, Jay McShann, they burn more brightly, brightly today. There ain't nothing in the world that'll take your breath away. Like Alan Basie, Fats Waller, Pine Topper, Errol Garner, Hamp Hawes, Norman Simmons, Kenny Drew, Bobby Timmons, Duke Pearson, Duke Jordan, Hank Jones still recording. Oscar got the Grammy, but Bill Evans put the whammy on Miles. Yes, on Miles. I'm very aware of how you can't really teach people anything. You have to make the material available and then they'll have to learn it. You can't make somebody believe that what you're talking about is important by throwing a lot of facts at them. <laughs> one of the young lions. He says he's his own Walkman, and his name is Bobby McFerrin. Welcome to Sidron on Record. I'm Ben Sidron, and this week, Bobby McFerrin is my guest for a full hour dedicated to jazz singing. What is a jazz singer, and how does one become one? Stick around and find out. Say what? Say what? National Public Radio airs Sidron on Record, Ben's most recent way to tell people about jazz. Musicians talk with Sidron about new records, their music, their personal philosophies. Okay, let's make a radio show. There's avant-garde, there's fusion, there's traditional, you know, there's Scott Hamilton doing mainstream jazz and Jamaluddin Takuma doing flash techno funk and there's Art Blakey giving you the true stuff from the 30s and there's Carla Blay telling you how she became a composer. <laughs> and then you really That's be able good. to do what yeah. you want to do, you know. Let's let's get some money behind you. They wanted you know, to make him into a star. The kind of money you want, and then you can they really wanted to. Do. I never believe that. He never and I think did. that's one thing that's saying. I never believe that uh -huh. if, okay. I, if I went in this direction. Okay, I'm going to do a show with uh, Bobby McFerrin. Now, what am I going to play for Bobby McFerrin? Well, there's a lot of stuff I could play for him. Will he like this? Will he not like that? Is this something that I'd like his reaction to? Then I pick five or seven records I want to play for Bobby McFerrin. Songs off of five or seven records. And I tell him, when I call him up, there's a point in the show where I want you to do a demonstration. But that's really all I have time to do is, is watch. That's later on, out. when he does his demonstration. He says, it's easy, anybody could do this. Chest voice, head voice, boop, 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 boop. When, when I do it, it sounds like somebody fooling around. When he does it, it sounds like music. You know? <laughs> we talk for a bit, and I put another record on, and we talk about that. And hopefully, the process of being interviewed is absolutely uh, painless and invisible to the guest. I find refreshing is is if they have a good time, you know, if they think that you're just having a joyfully good time with the music. It doesn't matter if you don't know and if you make mistakes, you don't know all the words. There's something else that's underneath. I try to think of what is the essence of this kind of point of the conversation and how can I bring it out. And I try real hard uh, to leave it in the person's own words. It's going to take me wherever it is. You know. Then I go in and I edit the tape. I hand that script to an engineer. Mm -hmm. 
I'd be willing to give up performing. I'd be willing to give up recording. Uh, I wouldn't want to stop reporting. I'm driven, whether it's radio or television, to produce pieces that capture, not manufacture, that capture moments of this living thing because it's gone. Consider this. <laughs> What is a jazz singer, and how do you become one? Is it in the notes, or in just being totally free? I'm Ben Sidron, inviting you to join me for Sidron On Record, when my guest will be vocalist Bobby McFerrin. If we can't answer the above questions, at least we'll try to outline the problem. I have a few students, I'm my own walk, man. And, and they want to know about improvisation. I say, well, it's, it's a balance between... I'm my own walk, man. Um, Control and surrender. You know, it's like two sides of a highway. And, and you've got to walk down that yellow line. This week, Bobby McFerrin on Sidron on Record from NPR, National Public Radio. Say what? Say what? <laughs> I love it. Hey, Fabi, I'm in here. Citron also holds informal history classes when he performs around the country. At this Chicago club, he celebrates the talents of jazz greats from the past. Jazz musicians and jazz music are in trouble. They're in trouble because it's long form music in a time and place where the attention span of most people is three to seven minutes at the max. Uh, it's in trouble because uh, it tends to challenge people at a time when people are desperate to be emotionally asleep. Uh, it's in trouble because when you package it and tie a ribbon around it, uh, it doesn't look like all the other packages people are buying. Even if you go to the In the music clubs of Greenwich Village, there's no need to preach to the converted. These folks believe in the future of jazz. She's a very talented singer. Oh, I see. You're going to hear her tonight. She came in from Wisconsin. Uh... Tonight, Richard Davis brings them a new voice to confirm their faith in jazz. I decided that since I have now become involved with a lot of Wisconsin musicians and a lot of Wisconsin talent, that I would uh, bring some of that talent here to uh, New York. Fortunately, I did get the response I wanted from a young lady. And uh, 
She works at the uh, Wisconsin uh, Conservatory of Music on the faculty as the vocal uh, instructor, uh, professor, or faculty member. And uh, everybody in Milwaukee got very excited when they heard that uh, uh, this person was going to come into New York for a first time debut, they say in French. But I'd like to introduce to you Ms. Jessie Hawk. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Now, I, 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 I have to do this song because I've been singing it for, for years. And I never saw, I never saw this place that this song was about. So you can't come to New York and not do Duke Ellington's A-Train. The notes will live on. Yeah, the uh, the approach to the tones will live on. Uh, but the essence, you've got to get next to Richard Davis if you want his message. And next to Richard are the folks who will make the music and move the message. Richard Davis and Ben Sidron use the clubs, the classes, and the airways to seduce the listener. But finally, the future of jazz resides with the young musicians who will be doing it. So finally, beyond theory, beyond rehearsals, jazz class helps these students meet reality. Creating an atmosphere, speaking the language, they take a first shaky step toward the outside. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doug. What are you doing here? Oh. And the turnaround is all chromatic. Yes. So why don't you play very simple? You just see how hard it is to get people to play simple? <laughs> no, no, it's I, very I, difficult. Now, it's three points in learning. is uh, reading about it, theorizing, and doing it. You know, and a jazz player, he has to do it as he's learning it. One, two, you know what to do, I hope. Once more, one, two, 
One, two, three, four. G, F. Okay, listen. That class is a class on improvisation, and that's just about what I'm doing when I teach that class. I'm improvising on what I'm seeing happening at the moment. Davis calls it club dating. The classroom turns into a jazz club, and Davis prepares these kids for the lingo that goes with the territory. Good. What you should be doing is testing your ears and see if he's playing the right notes. If you hear him play a wrong note, raise your hand or let him know that you, he's going to get fired. This is a gig, baby. You know, we've got a lot of bass players that play that thing right down the first time. I try to give them a lot of uh, street talk on purpose because that's what they're going to be faced with when they're out there. Not saying that they're not exposed to it already, but I want to make sure. I want to make sure that they uh, uh, hear language that hurts sometimes because I don't want them hurt for the first time trying to play uh, jazz with a group. Now really listen to this because this is a whole, your whole life is built around this. But once they le learn when they learn from him and then they go out and do it, they're going to find out this, they're glad they were with him because they can go back to what he said because now, right now, they're stuck. <laughs> <laughs> come up when you feel you can cut it. Abby, come on up, say these changes. Get to hear how it flows. Nobody's coming up? Tim, say no changes. Okay, Phil, you got one more chance. And I want Marianne to blow on those changes after this. Quiet. Shh. The classroom is a skeletal part of their existence in learning how to play. And I, I remind them of that every time because the classroom is just saying these are the things you need to do. Now, the time they spend doing it is what's important. He would put me in situations where I would have to learn. He would, Students past uh, and present testify to their one-of-a-kind experiences with Davis. And even though I Former student to Steve Rohn. I'd have to get ready to do the job. So sometimes he'd give me a job playing with a, uh, a cabaret singer, another time maybe with a uh, funk group. Another, one time, the most uh, diversified um, situation like that that he gave me was uh, playing solo bass behind uh, four black Muslim poets and I had to play for four hours just bass while they talked and they did the poetry and that's something I never could conceive of. Why don't you just play it for me and get the music out of it and make it flow and, and soar like a bird you know like just flying with the notes just like a glide. <laughs> Bassist Doug O'Connor returned to the United States from Italy to study with good. Davis at the university. Good. Very good. I knew I would be working with one of the masters. I had no idea what kind of beautiful personal rapport we would be working on or working with. In the jazz sense, I don't want to tell the students too much on how to play because, as you said before, I don't want them all to be real little Richard Davis is running around giving him my little licks and my little cliches and things I like to do, and they always sound the same. I kind of talk to them and lead them in the right direction and see what they come up with. Doug and his fellow student musicians follow Davis' belief that although study may begin in the classroom, the impromptu jam sessions outside are where the learning really happens. And it took me about a month and a half and then a performance to actually get things working and now I'm best friends with one of these players and it's things are really working out and we get together outside and we just jam and it's a lot of fun. Do it again. Just had Don't dinner together the other night with, uh, with a couple other musicians and we just jammed all night long. It was a blast. It's, that that I, is the class right there. What are you talking about? The classroom skeletal. I was, I was even, is. we were even singing. And we mm -hmm. weren't drunk or high or anything like that, but we were just saying, hey, let's make music, let's sing. Who gets the third, who gets the fifth? That's the class right there. I like to hear that. The thing I'm doing is just showing them which direction to go, but they can't do anything unless they do what he just said happen. Yeah, music is sensational. So you can do anything with it if you know what you're doing. And then sometimes it's best that you don't know. 
Yeah. If you get too intelligent with music, though, you probably won't have anybody playing with you. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. But you learn music all the time. There's no ending. There's one thing that definitely has carried on through all the generations. It's the apprenticeship of music and of teaching. The way that Richard taught me, and still teaches me in a way, um, even though I don't see him on a regular basis to study, is the way I teach my students, and the way even some of them are starting to teach their students. So this is something that he set up with the, uh, the, the approach to music, the approach to technique, the approach to um, realistically getting jobs being a musician. So he set up an apprenticeship, I don't know if he was aware of it, and it's trickled down into a different generations of music. That's, that's a language. That, that's, that is a, uh, a standard ending. It's a standard way to, of getting out of something. Those are standard endings. Sing a couple of them. Uh, can you sound gruff so they can hear you and some of you kind of mad at them because they weren't listening? Do that. Okay, listen, listen to this. Do it, Kelly. Listen to this. That's me now. <laughs> sure you want to sound mean? Good. <laughs> see, the way I see it, that we all, no matter what individuality we have or what uniqueness we want to propose to ourselves or other people, we're all, like John Coltrane said, dipping out of the same vessel. We're all, uh, you know, hanging around the camp contributing little onions and uh, meats and potatoes to the camp stew. Davis and Sidron's time, talent, and voices are their contributions to the future of jazz. They know that encounters as brief as one high school class period can yield new converts. Yeah, that's nice. See, we like that. This feels good. <laughs> yeah. You say that each era of music sort of represented the particular feelings of the people at that time. So what, what do you think the, the music of the 80s represents? More or less fusion of uh, the rock and the jazz. So they're actually coming together? Oh, sure. They have been coming together for some time. Uh, I think Miles Davis is given credit for recording the first album of their type. And that was in the late 60s. Jazz has always been fusion music, right? It's always been the music of uh, Western and Afro-American civilizations right. from the beginning. It's always been a kind of fusion music. What's different today is electronics, <laughs> because jazz used to grow in nightclubs and be right there in, in the streets with the people. I think one of the things that's important about what we're doing today, the fact that we're here, not having you write down and take notes and give you a test, but we're physically here. An experience like this, jazz built into the education system on some level, is one of the only ways this music will continue to grow. And grow it will if Davis and Sidron have their way. Those missionaries of music, teachers extraordinaire, keep right on spreading the word about jazz. It's just like the beginning, it's just like Boogie Woogie, but I'll put some new stuff in there. Okay. <laughs> What's the word? Someone stole my brand new Chevrolet.
as the hills. Old as the hills. That's older than the hills. Jazz is not dead, and it never will be. You all out there. Thank you very much. Let's take a bow. Thank you. This program is made possible in part by grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Norman Bassett Foundation, Friends of WHA-TV, the Dane County Cultural Affairs Commission, and the Wisconsin Arts Board.